my name is Hans Larsen. Um, I am a senior architect at OMA. Um, and uh, I've been involved uh, together with Alex from the start of this uh, embryonic uh, Hospital of the Future project. Um, I generally am working a lot on uh, projects in uh, the early and middle phases uh, at the office. So that involves the, the moment when you first get the brief. Uh, and in this case, also even before you get the brief um, and conceptualize and uh, try to put together uh, the ideas uh, for the project. Hi, um, I'm Alex Retegan and I'm part of the communications team at uh, OMA. I work closely with uh, Rainier Dehraf, one of the partners um, at uh, OMA on uh, various uh, uh, research uh, projects and one of them is the um, Hospital of the Future which indeed I started together with Hans uh, in early 2019. Since then yeah we we have um, developed it and uh, into various forms uh, like the video, the exhibition in Venice uh, and also an insert in the magazine O32C. Uh, it's, it's great to have you with us uh, on board uh, for this series that we've been doing, uh, it's called Stirring Together. Uh, it's in line with Hashim Sakis's uh, curatorial note for this year, which is How Will We Live Together? So it's a little stir twist on the title. Uh, and uh, we were very intrigued by uh, Hospital of the Future as an ongoing research project since uh, 2019, when the world just kind of flipped on itself. And now it has grown as a research project to uh, a completely, you know, it has grown manifold to, to be to encompass much, much more than what it was initially. And we hope that it goes uh, in, in much better and larger, broader direction in the future. So uh, I hope you had a chance to go through uh, stirworld.com and the, and the series of uh, articles and videos that we have been putting together. Yes, yeah, indeed, uh, very intriguing and, uh, and interesting um, discussions with some of the participants at the Biennale. Yeah. I looked at the, the interview with uh, the Canadian team um, doing the, um, this green screen um, Canada project, which was quite interesting. Thank so, you. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, just to kick off uh, a round of questions that go, you know, that, that get more specific as we move. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the project's inception? What, what led to the thought of visualizing or, or theorizing a hospital of the future? Well, in a very banal way, um, it began with uh, the intention of the office to pursue some hospital projects back in 2019 and even earlier, actually. Um, and um, we thought that it would be more opportune uh, rather than just, let's say, putting our name on a uh, letter of interest to uh, really uh, examine the topic uh, a little bit further. And uh, what began as a sort of initial curiosity uh, really caught fire um, because it opened up so many interesting questions and pointed out so many issues, uh, which uh, the more and more we, we investigated them, the more and more we realized their fundamental importance. Uh, so these projects, as Alex was saying, um, were uh, led by and, and still are led by the partner Renier de Graaf. Um, together with whom we uh, simply delved further into the issues around the hospital. Um, and, uh, and as time has gone on, as projects have come and gone, um, the Hospital of the Future project remained as a sort of, uh, let's say, a mirror world or a kind of an echo uh, of the, the real world projects that we were uh, developing. Uh, and in that sense, um, it uh, echoes not only the hopes, but also the frustrations of working in healthcare today as an architect. And let's say a lot of the, um, a lot of the issues that we faced um, stimulated us to, let's say, dream further and bigger in the research projects itself in the hopes that um, it might stimulate some uh, some interest in sympathy and kindred spirits uh, to, to also let's say, take these questions farther than only a particular project. So uh, 
looking at the visuals that uh, we've seen for Hospital of the Future, some of them are sort of direct visualizations, especially from the from the exhibition at the, at the Venice Biennale itself. But there are some that are, you know, these uh, abstract visualizations that seem like uh, bricolages or, or collages of images and uh, uh, visuals from different places that are supposed to sort of convey an idea. So if I were to quickly ask you, what is the very first visual that pops into your head when I say Hospital of the Future, when I term Hospital of the Future, what is the the, the first visual? Um, uh, again, from the, the work that we've done and the images that we've developed, um, these images which show uh, buildings which are normally not hospitals, uh, such as either a an office or a uh, convention center, uh, where uh, together with the team, uh, um, uh, Adam Cook and Magdalena Narkiewicz developed images which uh, represent uh, healthcare situations, like uh, medical workers or nurses or doctors inside. So where we collage. Uh, and, and in that sense, do a sort of a trompe l'oeil where you believe for a moment that the building was originally a hospital, uh, even though it wasn't, uh, of course, from the beginning. And I, I think also, um, because we've discovered all kind of contradictions, um, um, it, it felt um, somehow more expressive to work with, with um, contrasting images. So for me, I think that somehow the hospital of the future is best encompassed by, by this contrast of an image of robots in somewhere in an uh, undefined space and then an idyllic garden that maybe tops up uh, um, this, this space. Was there anything from the back of house, right? Like not the visuals? But what was the most interesting or the most uh, significant finding from this research in terms of functionality um, uh, of the, the hospital spaces? Um, one of the discoveries um, which we uh, keep running across um, is most definitely the, the notion that um, the hospital as we know it, which is actually in uh, the history of the world, quite a finite uh, entity. It's something which uh, began uh, with the rise of certain medical technologies in the 20th century, things like the X-ray uh, and so on, which necessitated uh, a massive building uh, in order to house that technology, uh, and which then at the same time uh, became the opportunity to serve a larger number of people than were served by one doctor before. Uh, that this entity as we know it is actually, um, well, that perhaps its days are numbered. Um, simply when you look at the, the incredibly rapid cycle of technological development, uh, medical technology today, um, which um, the moment you try to embark on designing a hospital, uh, you're actually looking at a brief which is already obsolete. Uh, so it's not even that the building which you will construct may or may not be obsolete. But the brief that you're looking at is many times surpassed by the time the project has been uh, chosen. And sort of as Alex uh, is hinting, um, perhaps there are ways to even more fundamentally incorporate technology into the hospital to the point where it's an almost, uh, it's not even uh, an architectural design anymore. Perhaps it's more like um, figuring out um, a highly functional piece of infrastructure um, that in a sense designs itself. Uh, rather than um, an architect in uh, in the capital A um, designing a hospital. What what is interesting about hospitals, I I, I find is that it's the uh, typology where this clash between architecture and technology is the most prominent. I mean this this kind of observation that the building becomes obsolete the moment that it's finished or already by the time that the the brief uh, is launched. It's only a, as a consequence of the rapid developments in, in technology that uh, are almost impossible to match by architects because somehow, yeah, architecture, no matter uh, how much we would like to, to think uh, otherwise, it, it has not progressed significantly for, I don't know, the last 
since the discovery of of reinforced concrete let's say so uh, yeah my next question is uh, it emerges from the current uh, state of uh, the hospital systems uh, especially in in countries like india so through mm. the last year and uh, a part of this year especially for us uh, we've seen the current hospital system to uh, virtually collapse under the sheer number of, of cases and the pressure that was you know sort of impinged upon them through uh, through the pandemic so uh, through the course of the study did this project the hospital of the future at any time uh, sort of become a response to that condition or did it become like uh, you know maybe that future is not that far maybe we need to kind of rectify this system by bringing in some ideas from uh, your project i think with the pandemics and with all this crisis that that um, emerged um, yeah as i was saying earlier it, it really reinforced some observations uh, that that we were just about to make or making at the time and and one was this um, issue of of uh, constantly decreasing the number of of beds in the hospital and that per se maybe you can wonder why that happened but actually the the larger uh, problem to discuss it's the idea that um, healthcare has become has moved on from a public duty to a service and being a service then it had to follow the logic of the market economy and as a consequence of that in the name of efficiency which is another name for profitability um, the number of beds uh, were sacrificed i guess yeah one thing that uh, we are advocating or uh, at least inviting people to think about because it's obviously very early to say is how to make uh, the hospital more autonomous more independent and more self sufficient yeah i mean you have these sort of uh, really insane situations where india produces 20% of the generic drugs uh, of the entire world um uh, so there's a massive production capacity um which number one um uh, being generic drugs, that means that these are um, licenses that have expired, so that, uh, that basically uh, a big pharma company uh, no longer uh, seeks to earn a profit out of them, so they can become more widespread. Uh, so there's the, let's say, this bottleneck of um, having to wait a certain amount of time to be able to produce um, medication for all. Uh, which of course is coming under question, especially in, uh, in the middle of trying to deal with vaccinations for a pandemic, for instance. And simply the sheer fact of this capacity uh, not being used better necessarily, not just in India, I suppose, but in many countries, uh, uh, not more directly uh, for the people that are nearby. Um, so in that sense, uh, I think it's totally also about what Alex is saying, this, uh, this uh, alter of uh, efficiency uh, on which so many let's say basic kind of uh, you might say uh, even rights uh, have been sacrificed and uh, and that indeed needs to be called into question that of course doesn't mean that we need to go in the opposite uh, direction and mindlessly build huge hospitals necessarily uh, I, I think it just means that the, the discussion needs to be had about how to how to deal with that in a better way and, um, and uh, when you keep in mind that the, the more, um, uh, the longer we live, um, that unfortunately also means the more treatment we need. So it's a sort of a snake that bites its tail. And uh, getting healthier in quotation marks, it doesn't necessarily mean actually being fully healthy. It just simply means needing more maintenance. And that's also a reality that, uh, that needs to be faced and, and integrated into a bigger, uh, approach towards healthcare. How does all of this tie into, or how do you see this installation tie into um, uh, Hashim Sarkis's How Will We Live Together, uh, in spite of the Ouroboros uh, snake biting its own tail? Uh, how, how else does it tie into that? Well, I would say we, I mean, we, we had started this project um, before um, knowing about the Biennale, and we kindly received an invitation uh, from Hashim and his team uh, 
uh, after uh, a sort of first video, which we released in 2019. Um, I, I think that we, while not trying to make a conscious effort to uh, phrase it or make it fit into the, the topic, um, that's simply because, uh, I mean, evidently the question of health is primordial to how will we live together. I think we, we need to be in some form of health in order to even consider a discussion of living together. I think it's quite yeah. literally the broader question, uh, will we need to live to be able to live together? Uh, <laughs> So uh, my next question is about the about the installation of the Biennale itself. So mm -hmm. the images show, uh, you know, a collection of beds uh, that are sort of enclosed by uh, enlarged hospital screens, and they have the Corbusier modulum and somewhere there. So uh, what is the, what is the thought behind this uh, installation and the way it came about? The the way it came about was. Um let's say out of the, um, well, it was actually for such a simple installation, it was uh, not necessarily a direct process. Uh, we, we tried a lot of things out uh, and we tested many different ideas, um, different scales of complication and elaboration. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, what we thought was most important was to uh, simply have a space to view the film uh, that wouldn't be perceived as being an installation per se, but simply a, a space within the Arsenale um, that would make people kind of look again uh, and wonder if it was uh, really a, uh, you know, uh, a design or not. Um, and, uh, and in that sense, um, we, we chose after, of course, long consideration, um, because, of course, the pandemic was quite near to Italy and there were many people who were uh, impacted uh, and, and of course in hospitals in Italy uh, during the course of the pandemic uh, but you know our, our sort of idea is that um, uh, you know already today and in the near future we will increasingly all be considered patients in some form or another um, and so in that sense we merge together the idea of a cinema like a temporary cinema and the hospital ward uh, where all us future patients uh, can uh, watch a film about the hospital, which we will all be living in, whether we know it or not. And, uh, and we simply chose to, uh, you know, not design anything. We simply used elements that already exist and we played with the scale of them in order to dramatize the effect. So the curtains are about, about three meters tall. They're simply blown up in all scales uh, by the factor of two. Uh, in order to create a sort of a gargantuan, um, let's say, effect, uh, which also hopefully, uh, let's say, registers on the scale of the Arsenale space itself. And, uh, and that was it, basically. A whole new meaning to the idea of drive-in cinema. Uh, mm -hmm. right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I'm curious about the modular map. Uh, mm -hmm. the the modular man in different states of being a patient why mm -hmm. why use the modular man as an icon for that i i think that uh, there we wanted to somehow criticize this idea of of the standard and the ideal uh, human it's kind of coming from this modernist logic where there was a certain norm that was um, um being uh, sought and um, I think that in a way by ha having all this this kind of ironic uh, deviations from from uh, Le Corbusier's modular man we are just expressing also this um, ambiguity of what it means to be healthy and what it means to be sick these days. There's an anecdote from uh, Henri Bernard, the French uh, hospital architect uh, who uh, was kind of, uh, he played a big role in the creation of this uh, typology of hospital that we see a lot today, uh, where you have a podium uh, of operating rooms and then you have a tower of uh, bed wards. Uh, and he said that the hospital should become uh, as much as possible an efficient machine, which simply takes people in uh, and quickly fixes them uh, and then gets them back out into, uh, as he said, la vie normale, uh, the normal life. 
And um, this uh, word or this this phrase, la vie normale, was for us a sort of a subtitle for a very long time of the exhibition design. Uh, we wanted to play on this idea, as, as Alex is saying, regarding chronic disease and so on, that today actually there is no normal healthy life. Uh, and then that's what we wanted to show uh, through the modular man, uh, that indeed there is no normal uh, standard human anymore and uh, we're all afflicted in some way or other so talking about the installation itself and of course you know again uh, judging strictly from the images that we've seen because unfortunately we can't be there uh, the the visual uh, quality and you know the lighting on on the installation on on the beds and everything it's quite dramatic there's a there's a very certain uh, aesthetic being followed, uh, which is sort of, uh, I would say, contrasting to uh, the primordial or the, you know, the kind of accepted notion of hospitals as places of hope, let's just say. So what, mm -hmm. what do you think is that contrast uh, all about? Again, I know that, you know, it is deliberate, but uh, it would be great if you could just shed some light on that. Uh, no pun intended. <laughs> I think there it arises from exactly this, um, this overlap of, uh, as you uh, quite uh, cleverly put it, Devanshi, the drive-in cinema and the hospital, uh, simply by overlapping these two different um, references, you come up with something which is in between. And uh, I think that we also purposefully wanted to have some element of uh, discomfort, uh, of this idea of facing a kind of a cold, stark truth uh, which at the same time we communicated in a very, uh, let's say, cheerful cartoon fashion. Uh, so I think we, we, we wanted to just bring up these contradictory, let's say, uh, reactions to, uh, to healthcare. Uh, I think by no means would we want to design a hospital um, that had that kind of lighting. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, when, when dealing just with this sort of rhetorical domain, uh, we thought it was interesting to, to hang on to that slight kind of uh, unheimlich uh, feeling. And to be honest, it, it matches quite well with, with the arsenal, with the space <laughs> there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, definitely the brick walls behind and the, you know, the raw concrete uh, sort of columns, yeah. they add a very, uh, if I might say, Orwellian uh, outlook to the entire yeah. thing. I think that's, that's what you were going for. Yeah, I yeah, mean, in a way, also, half of it was already there. Yeah, we've also been having problems with the lighting installation. It keeps malfunctioning <laughs> and the lights are like blinking and or changing colors. So it seems like, a, you know, a kind of a broken down, uh, broken down hospital, um, <laughs> which kind of adds to the, uh, the effect, I assume. <laughs> But I, I did want to go back to something you all did mention before, which was this idea of the machine, uh, of this robotic sense of the hospital and, you know, about how it should function. Um, there is something with hospitals that we always do, especially now hear about all these human stories, right, about that personal touch. So how does that, and I know this is, of course, something that feeds into then project proposal that you're working on so how does that difference between the idea of, of that robotic and very humane uh, sense of how a hospital is about care how does that balance out i think that um well there, there was a seminal study uh, by a man called roger unrich in the late 70s early 80s if i recall um, which um, discovered that when a patient uh, who is recovering uh, from an operation uh, has a view of trees outside, um, then he uh, not only recovers faster, uh, but apparently he experiences, uh, let's say, subjectively less pain uh, from his recovery. And uh, he, yeah, he feels better. He, leads, he needs less medication. And this observation was then promptly jumped upon by, of course, many uh, uh, hospital directors who, who saw there the opportunity to improve healthcare and also render it more uh, efficient. Um, and the, the, I think the irony of that uh, realization, though, is that it's never been fully addressed in hospital design per se. Um, and when you look at many hospitals that have been built today, you might see outdoor spaces 
uh, but these are more often than not sort of cavernous pits of light, you know, where you, you see the other patient maybe 10 meters away and you see a little patch of grass uh, or in more brutally cynical um, um, instances, you simply see a poster with trees or you see a piece of art in the hallway. Um, and so there has been a very unresolved attempt to actually make the hospital more human. Uh, and at the same time, there has been uh, a similarly unresolved way to try to bring in the machine. Uh, I think one of the ideas that we, we've had in mind or, or trying to develop also through ongoing hospital projects is that maybe if you really went full circle with uh, accommodating um, this automation, uh, you would actually, uh, instead of clogging it in the human spaces, but putting it more underground or above, you can actually really give more outdoor space because you didn't need to mix all of these things together. Um, so there's a sort of uh, need to really go farther uh, with how you design from the beginning for the machine. And, and by really giving it more space, um, by making hallways, for example, that are optimized for machines, that are therefore smaller, uh, that are maybe out of sight, um, you're then able to give much more space to the patient to actually really be able to see outside, potentially. So, uh, yeah, my next question is a little, I think, objective in nature. Uh, so when we look at recent developments in hospital uh, or, or, or hospitals or studies with respect to hospitals in the architectural realm and how we can improve, uh, you know, uh, uh, patients experiencing care or patients recovering there, it's it's we see the conversation shifting from infrastructure to to patient psychology and how architecture can help you know having rooms for example very very primordial examples having rooms facing uh, open spaces or the psychology of color blending into these spaces the other aspect is uh, of uh, of speedy construction and of how modular uh, you know these hospitals and cabins actually need to be so we sort of minimize on the aspect of uh, these huge structures coming together. So this is, I think, uh, in my uh, opinion, what seems to be encompassed in the very immediate future of the hospital, right? But the kind of future that you seem to have sort of conjured up or the visuals that you seem to have conjured up, what is the timeline or what is a, you know, just a speculation? When do you think uh, we can actually sort of arrive at that reality? I think actually it's quite immediate reality because, I mean, if you look on a longer term reality, you might even question whether the hospital will still be a building. I mean, there are all kinds of uh, scenarios that uh, that speculate in that sense. Yeah, I think they can start immediately, but it might take a long time to come to a proper fruition. I think in that sense, I mean, um, you were mentioning uh, Devanchi regarding our exhibition, if it was showing a future apocalypse, I mean, with regards to hospitals and healthcare, we live in a present apocalypse, and hopefully that uh, generates an urgency to, to deal with the problem. But on the other hand, them being quite structural problem, problems, uh, it might take a while to really uh, see a more meaningful change. Mm -hmm.